Our moderator is Ian Masters, who will introduce our speakers. Ian's a BBC-trained broadcast journalist who's covered national security affairs for over 25 years on public radio. He's the host of Background Briefing and Live from the Left Coast on KPFK. Um, it can be heard Sundays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. He, in addition to producing documentaries for ABC News and Frontline, he's been a senior fellow at UCLA Center for Strategic and International Affairs, the UCLA Center for International Relations, and he was a consultant to the Center for National Security Studies at Los Alamos in New Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Ian Masters. Thank you, Claudia. And thank you all for coming tonight. And a special welcome to Pakistan's Consul General, Mr. Sayed Ibn Abbas. Our guests will speak for about 15 minutes each. Then we'll have a brief uh, discussion together on stage and then open up for an extended Q&A with you, the audience. The good news is that the anti-American era will soon be over. And by that, I mean self-inflicted anti-Americanism. The other kind seems to have a life of its own. The bad news is that we are reaping the whirlwind in Pakistan, where its people, its leaders, and its military are in such a blind fury at America, they perhaps can't see the dire threats to their own country from within. It is clear everything the Bush administration has done has exacerbated that country's internal and external problems, as we have outsourced the war on terror to Pakistan at the same, at the same time providing a disincentive for Pakistan to help us stabilize Afghanistan by allowing India to establish a presence in Karzaistan, as it's jokingly referred to, after Hamid Karzai, a leader holed up in Kabul who previously ran a restaurant in Baltimore and whose brother is one of the world's biggest opium dealers. Apparently, we are asking Pakistan to risk civil war to fix a mess we created by as President-elect Obama has said many times, taking our eye off the ball and fighting the wrong war in the wrong place. Without getting into whether we won in Iraq and what that means, our own military leaders are telling us we are losing the war we easily won in Afghanistan because we didn't deliver the fruits of victory and bring peace. Clearly, in the case of Pakistan, there is a great gap between America's expectations and Pakistan's capabilities and the alliance is dangerously frayed with increasing anger on one side and growing mistrust on the other. Tonight, we will try to approach this impasse by doing what is rarely done, and that is ask a Pakistani about Pakistan. In this case, a general who will be able to talk about Pakistan's military, but not for their military, so that we will perhaps learn about attitudes, perceptions, and how the world looks from their point of view. There is much to learn, and rather than be constantly told the ISI military intelligence calls the shots, that they are a government within a government, etc., I'm nonetheless sure the audience would appreciate some clarity on who is in charge, especially of the nuclear arsenal. It would also be helpful to learn why it is that arresting those accused of the recent attacks on Mumbai is so unpopular with the so-called street. What pressure is the government under, and if so, why? Why do the people feel sympathy for the perpetrators of Mumbai and alienation from us. We are told that in 2002, the ISI cut the terrorist group lashkar e taiba loose and they were demobilized. But having created an, uh, an army of soldiers of the pure, apparently it is not so easy to put them out to pasture and many have joined the reconstituted and burgeoning Taliban and the vestiges of Al-Qaeda on the border with Afghanistan. And recently, just 10 of them held the financial capital of India at gunpoint for three days and shattered the nascent peace efforts of Pakistan's foreign minister, who was, hardly coincidentally, in New Delhi, extending an olive branch at the time of the terrorist attack. Obviously, those who want war and confrontation appear to have won this round. But what about the next? We can't have peace in Afghanistan without peace in Pakistan and we can't have peace in Pakistan unless there is a peace with India. Big questions for our guests to chew on. Let's begin with Brigadier General Faroz Khan, Far Faroz Hassan Khan, who is a retired Pakistani Army Brigadier General, currently on the faculty of the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. From the mid-90s 
Till his retirement, he represented Pakistan in bilateral and multilateral arms control negotiations and non-proliferation conferences. He holds an MA from the School of Advanced International Studies, SAIS, at the Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. He has been a visiting fellow at a number of U.S. think tanks analyzing security and weapons of mass destruction issues in South Asia and is currently working on a forthcoming book on Pakistan's nuclear history, trajectories, and future. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Farooz Khan. Mr. Masters, uh, organizers of the Hammer Museum, thank you very much for your very kind introduction to the subject as well as me. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, when we initially talked about uh, coming and discussing this subject that has just been introduced to you, uh, I could not have imagined that when I'll be standing on this rostrum, we will be uh, talking about India and Pakistan. The very title of this conference was Chaos on the Border of Afghanistan, so I was focused on that particular thing. But today I stand here before you speaking about an issue that we almost thought that India and Pakistan have actually outgrown from that kind of a s uh, syndrome in which they would hurl each other into crisis, especially after four years of sustained peace. Regrettably, one horrible incident did that. There may be fury and anger in, uh, in Pakistan as you introduced because, but I think you did not probably said, or probably the media here has not felt that there is a great deal of sympathy in Pakistan as well. This is not easily computed here. A lot of people in Pakistan, they look across the border as their kith and kin. This is, and I don't speak here, by the way, I should use the disclaimer. I don't speak for Pakistan government or for the Department of Defense in which I serve here. I speak for myself here. This disclaimer is important. But there is much more to it than what has just, what, what, what makes the headline here. And I hope that in very this brief moment, I can capture those factors that actually lead to all this. And I'll be very happy to answer the question because there are far more than what, what has been uh, brought, up, brought about here. Typical Western way of thinking about nation state is as you have grown into the nation state, hardened borders, rule of law, separation of politics and religion, governance, strong institutions, economic growth, None of these things are applicable to states which are still in a state of formulation and in an evolutionary process. The states we are talking about here were in a time warp under colonial heel when all this first experiment was going on in Europe. They did not experience that enlightened moderation. And when that enlightened moderation was brought onto this state, they revolted against the state, which was a colonial state at the time, that is ingrained into the people and therefore, the fundamental problem is that the state and the society are in a state of flux which they have not been able to reconcile. And the arc begins from Afghanistan and goes right through Bangladesh into Burma. At the core was the heartland what is India's today. Democratic, multi-ethnic, multicultural, vibrant economic India today has had 300 years of state structure, governance, bureaucracy, railways, soft power, culture together, which was in the heartland. That's where the movement began. And if you move outwards from this heartland of this vibrant India, shining India, you are moving into the periphery where these structures did not exist. Afghanistan never enjoyed the British Empire structures. Pakistan never inherited those. These were states that was just barely formed in the 19th century. These were the peripheries. And these societies you are talking about are tribal, agrarian, feudal. And we talk about big democracy and big experiments out here. This is not Europe. This is the state in formation here. Move further to the east towards Bangladesh and Assam and these periphery area, still not settled in the shining India. We forget a lot of things when we are computing the, you know, uh, the, the whole. The wholesome picture is, is important to understand. From this arc from Kabul to Bangladesh, 
you will find insurgencies, you will find leftist movements, you will find religious movements, ethnicity, role of religion, sectarianism, Hindu Muslim communal rights still going on. These things have not settled down. India is the only state in the whole region that had passed through the dangerous decades of the 50s and the 60s. And thanks to the structure that they inherited, and thanks to the leadership in India and the choices they made, India was lucky. The Himalayas, the Indian Ocean, and the partition, by the way, which India actually cursed in the beginning, actually is a blessing in disguise. Because were it not for Bangladesh and Pakistan, today, Northwest Frontier Province would have been India's problem, just like Northeast is India's problem today. And all this crisis would have been part of that. Well, that's counterfactual. It is not good to do. But here is that the natural state is in a flux as far as the state and society is concerned. And many of these societies that exist on these peripheral areas, especially in Afghanistan and border areas of Pakistan, the society is stronger than the state. And the state has been struggling, just like the British struggled. 60 years is not sufficient for Pakistan to have done that. They did reasonably well up until the late 1970s, when the Soviet war actually turned the whole power structure and the entire edifice of security as it existed in Southwest Asia on its head. The rest is history, you're well familiar with. The 9-11 Commission actually records what actually exactly happened in this area. But then, you know, there were much more than this uh, event to happen. There were role of external actors in this geopolitical void. Not one major power in the world is not interested in this land, Afghanistan. Amazingly, that has sucked three consecutive centuries, three superpowers of the time. The British in the 19th, the Soviets in the 20th, and the Americans in the 21st century. And they don't have a single railway line there. They didn't have a road any there. They have no oil there. They have nothing there. They're not even water there, except watermelons, beautiful watermelons. And, and this is an enigma, a geopolitical enigma that, is, that we face here in that, in that region. And this is where um, uh, the role of external actors even today, not one actor is not interested in this. Uh, just as the introduction, just uh, you, you brought in your introduction. Everybody is interested in Afghanistan. Somebody wants a strategic depth. Others wanted to encircle their rivalries. For, for seven years since I've been in the US from 2001 onwards, I have been suggesting to the US government as a scholar when, when Woodrow Wilson Center and Brookings earlier on, be very careful in Afghanistan when you step in there. Do not extend your invitation beyond what their tolerance level is. Do not replace one tug with another tug. And when you're fighting an enemy which you have never seen him before, recall all of the, you guys, if you remember the debates in the fall of 2001, we were dealing with enemies that was nebulous. We were dealing with enemies you had never seen before. This was not Vietnam. And by the way, it is the time period now is more roughly than the American patients in Vietnam. So it's already exceeding there in any case. I speak to you because these, these factors are usually not brought about here. And there is a change in America now with President Obama has come out with this message of change, and I wanted to speak on that before I really close in uh, this discussion. Uh, I will be happy to answer more about Pakistan security policies, et cetera, those points, but it's not possible for me to fulfill all those things. But I do know that till the time I was serving in Pakistan, there were four structural policy, security policy, that came about to be changed almost a decade or so back, and specifically after the nuclear tests, we thought that, you know, once two countries go nuclear, then wars are things of the past. Then status quo is maintained. Then struggling, you know, to change or trying to browbeat the other coercion, brutality is no longer the case. This is the essence of the weapon of mass destruction. This is the, this is the power of the ultimate weapon that it does. India and Pakistan did not learn that nuclear lesson as quickly and the history of nuclear age tells you that. Nuclear learning curve is also very, very slow. But on comparable basis, they did learn the lesson much faster than the Cold War protagonists did so. They did go into crisis one after the other in the first five years. They did not deploy the nuclear weapons. They learned much quicker than five. That was the good news in South Asia. Today, South Asian can sleep peacefully because 
nuclear weapons are not pointing at each other the way they were in Cold War. But they still were unable to really handle the spectrum from asymmetric warfare to fighting conventional war and coercive deployment and going into nuclear. They're still learning. And this learning will come. We all thought that two hours before the Mumbai incident happened, they were pretty close to learning. One week before uh, this incident happened, uh, the president of Pakistan probably did not think through too much, but he was offering a known first use agreement to India and a non-nuclear agreement. He was talking about that there's a Pakistani in the, uh, in the heart, uh, there's an Indian in the heart of every Pakistani and vice versa. And he even went to the extent by saying he didn't know whether he's an Indian or a Pakistani speaking. That was, that was not just rhetoric. I think he was, he was saying a, a lot of things that many people in Pakistan and, and has actually had begun to think on these lines. Of course, he went a little overboard when he was talking about nuclear weapons. So, so those four policy pillars, which is the future for Afghanistan, and I say this uh, for, uh, the, for President Obama-elect, and I'll just be closing by, uh, my, my talks here, was that in this region, at least in Pakistan, at the core, of Pakistan's security policy was economic revival. That was what President Musharraf actually started off, even after the coup, that nothing is at the end point except the prosperity it comes. So anything else that comes across is actually, the end point is this. And there were three pillars around this. And those three pillars were nuclear deterrence. Nuclear deterrence will provide peace because it will prevent war, and that space must be utilized to overcome this. This would not happen unless and until conflict resolution with India is sought on any term and condition. Now, I am not privy to the latest what happened, but we do know that there was a lot of peace talk that went behind the scenes, and India and Pakistan were so close to res resolving the issue of Jammu and Kashmir when this Mumbai thing happened. I know that behind the scenes, a lot of things had come close. There was a different era coming altogether, but unfortunately, uh, the sad incident has taken away. So that pillar was rapprochement with India has to be important if you want nuclear deterrence to work because deterrence on its own cannot sustain itself. And lastly, there was no way that Afghanistan territory can be used any longer for any reason, strategic depth or vice versa. These four policies are so interlinked with each other that there was no question, but then it's easy said than done. It has taken a decade. It's gone even worse and worse because other state and other powerful things had outsourced, outwitted the state sector. The biggest challenge today is for states. States are beholden to non-state actors. States are beholden to Al-Qaeda. If Afghanistan and Pakistan fight, and America and Pakistan and Afghanistan fight, and, and all four countries are, India included, are fighting with each other, it is no, this is only victory for Al-Qaeda. They have already found space. They are already moving in the northwest frontier province. They have already bogged down over Pakistan armed forces. About six division strength of fighting already there. This army was never trained to fight the insurgency that it is it is embroiled in itself into. Uh, no armies are trained for this kind of insurgency. This is a very different war. So is Indian Army blocked in Kashmir for almost 20 years now. Nearly 500,000 forces there. They're shy of going into big force in Assam and, and then next slide areas. There is a semi movement inside India. Of course, there is a Lashkar e Taiba in Pakistan that has done probably uh, done what they have done. But it's impossible for them to operate alone. So now we are seeing how these networks have metastasized and stored pipe into each other. And instead of states focusing on that, states are each other in a blame game. That is the saddest story of the Mumbai incident. It did not happen. The tragedy of Mumbai incident goes back a little more. It, is, it goes back to the Marriott in Islamabad. It goes back to the Marriott in Jakarta and Bali. Terrorists now do not target planes. They have changed their tactics. They target public places. They target hotels. They don't even just target. The targets have changed. Their tactics have changed. They blow themselves with trucks. They blow themselves up with suicide belts. And they can throw 10 people across and they can start firing all the various forms of suicide. The terrorists are staying ahead of the curve of the state's capacity to deal with one, they change. And you are noticing that this change is the one which is chasing states, all states alike. And by the way, 27 countries are involved, all NATO, United States, Pakistan, India, everyone is involved. We've got to see the wholesome picture. Since President Obama, 
has suggested, and I, I think this, it is Mr. Holbrook who has been asked, here are some points, and I'll close on that, what he should do. First of all, I would suggest Mr. Obama should pick up where, where President Kennedy left. Those aware of the history of South Asia would know that it, the last appointment of that nature was appointed as Everett Harriman by President Kennedy in 1962. That was the last mission to South Asia. After that, there was never a person who would really go and look into all these problems. Uh, a lot of my Indian friends are very angry that Obama has probably talked about sending a Kashmir envoy. No, I don't think so that uh, it is so narrowly focused. Kashmir is just one part of the problem now, the way the problem has expanded, albeit that is still the key in many ways to resolve. He did not quite mean that. You need to have a wholesome picture of this whole area that is going to really figure out what are the cross cuttings, what are the cross border issues, how interstate, intrastate, problems have entwined into factors which are no longer the traditional security issues. And I'll go beyond my brief to say more. Who cares whether Kashmir is with India or with Pakistan now? The factor is now that India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh are, are fighting actually on water resources that emanate from the same area, food security, energy security, and terrorism. They don't, they don't see boundaries. These are common features of all these people, one billion plus people living under the Himalayas. If they don't see this problem like this, and they still continue about those little tiny borders in Siachen and, and Sir Creek, and still trying to determine, you know, those bureaucracy is beyond that. And it is only when a wholesome picture has to be seen so. He should go and look as to the wholesome problem as to where Al-Qaeda and others have actually, and under what kind of circumstances they have found a hole themselves. Two, look at the kind of military doctrines that are being still emerging under the shadow of nuclear. What kind of thinking are the two militaries, Indian and Pakistani, mostly are actually thinking and doing? What kind of war fighting they're doing? Take some experts and they're gonna look. Truly look into the capacities of the states. Truly look into the circumstances where they brute force and coercion and terrorizing the way that has been done at the point that was brought in the introduction is really the pathway to settle them. How many Pashtuns can really die? How many people can be really killed out there? This is really becoming counterproductive. You have to think out of the box. And therefore, most importantly, for last eight years that I've been here, I've seen that most of the debates here are concerned with the methods of gains on war on terror. The United States is not concerned about the reasons for the conflict. And the most important thing President Obama must see, and I hope he thinks so, that he must find out the reason for the conflict, not just the methods, because that's going to be a wild goose chase. Therefore, here are some of the points that I would say, I think uh, I'll stop here and I'll be happy to talk about all those questions that were raised by you. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Khan. And now, Roger Morris, who served on the senior staff of the National Security Council under Presidents Johnson and Nixon until resigning over the invasion of Cambodia. He's an award-winning investigative journalist and historian and the author of several books, including Richard Milhouse Nixon, The Rise of an American Pre Politician. His just-completed history of US policy and covert intervention in South Asia and the Middle East, entitled Shadows of the Eagle, will be published by Knopft in early 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Morris. Ian, thank you very much. And uh, General Ferris Khan, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to pick up on what the general said uh, in terms of talking about the reasons for all of this. I, uh, my presentation may be a, a, a bit offbeat since it concentrates on the, the role that American policy has played uh, in this crisis. And to do that, I, um, I need to go back to a bit of ancient history. And I hope you will, uh, you will bear with me as I do. Um, I, I never come to Los Angeles, and I always, I love this city. I spent a lot of time here uh, doing my Nixon research. I never come to this city without marveling at how uh, beautiful its homes are. And uh, I'm always reminded of, uh, 
of broad green lawns. And broad green lawns play uh, a rather fateful role in the, uh, the story I have to tell you. Uh, it was January 1972, when I think probably the general was, was still a fairly junior officer. Uh, January 1972, on a broad green lawn uh, in a beautiful city called Motan in, uh, in the Punjab. It's a city of, uh, of Sufi shrines and saints, as the general knows. Uh, that uh, the then leader of Pakistan, uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, uh, summoned uh, to a, a private estate 70 of the nation's top nuclear physicists and scientists and, uh, and asked them uh, to build a Pakistani bomb. And they all uh, agreed, uh, according to one account, with great enthusiasm. Uh, that's one broad green lawn. The other broad green lawn uh, is in the United States. Uh, it's on Long Island. It's a rather beautiful uh, state. It belonged to uh, an American who some of you uh, may, may recognize. Uh, his name was Robert Abercrombie Lovett. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, when he was enjoying this broad green lawn on Long Island, he was a very successful stockbroker on Wall Street, very well connected. Uh, 1920s and 30s, of course, totally unlike anything we've seen recently in, uh, on Wall Street. Um, he was so well connected, in fact, that he played a role in, uh, in president making in the sense that he facilitated uh, the, uh, the private fortune of a man named Joseph Kennedy, who got out of the, uh, of the stock market just in time to avoid uh, the 1929 crash. Bob Lovett was a legend uh, on Wall Street uh, as a broker, and he went on to become a very prominent official in the American government. Uh, he served uh, in the War Department during World War II and then became Secretary of Defense after the war, and even more important, uh, became what Arthur Schlesinger, the historian, called the household deity of the American foreign policy establishment. Uh, and there's a wonderful scene in David Halberstam's uh, memorable book, The Best and the Brightest, uh, in which Jack Kennedy, at this very moment in the transition to the new Kennedy administration, a moment that, that Barack Obama is going through, is looking to form his new national security team. And uh, to his house, his townhouse in Georgetown, he calls uh, Bob Lovett and sits him down. And uh, so respected, so honored is Lovett that he offers him uh, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, uh, any job that he wants, treasury, you, you name it, Bob, you can have it. Well, his health has not been so good lately. He turns it down. But, but Kennedy then says, and it's all, it's all there in, in Halberstam's wonderful account, well, please then uh, name the rest of the men who will, uh, who will form my national security team. And Lovett does just that. Uh, he gives Kennedy uh, hearty recommendations for Secretary of State Dean Rusk and Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara and uh, his national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, and uh, the names and men you, uh, you know and remember so well as the best and the brightest who authored Vietnam. Well, um, on, that, on that broad green lawn, Bob Levitt was, was popular in the 1920s and 30s with his Wall Street uh, colleagues uh, for his hilarious performances uh, mimicking the funny people of the world. Uh, he had a, quite a rubber face and was very good at accents. And he, he mimicked uh, Asians, Indians, uh, what would be uh, Pakistanis. Uh, he loved to mimic uh, Russians and Chinese and, and all those hilarious characters that one could, could make fun of. Uh, beneath the surface, beneath his, his Wall Street smoothness, Bob Lovett was a dyed-in-the-wool racist uh, and uh, quite a provincial. Uh, he was also very instrumental in placing the key officials who would serve in the new Central Intelligence Agency after World War II. Well, broad green lawns. Uh, I, I wanted to bring those two to your attention because they're, they're relevant to the story I have to tell. I wanted to read to you, uh, just very briefly, uh, some relevant passages from my new book. Uh, they're in part um, a kind of memoir, but they're also, of course, a reflection on uh, American foreign policy in South Asia. And I should add the caveat that they are, of course, only my own opinion and in no way reflect the views of, uh, of the Hammer Museum or these distinguished gentlemen uh, on, on the stage. Um, 
This is more ancient history. This goes back to Pakistan, and the date is November 1967. A day fever hot beneath a leaden sky. The air on the plain is still and stifling, though the gusts blow high from the brown Punjabi hills, and the US defense attaches plotting little DC-3 had to drone sturdily through the morning to fly us here. We are barely 50 miles southeast of Ralpindi, and the dedication of the new Mongla Dam evokes some durbar of the Victorian Raj. The Pakistanis have been struggling to build this project for 15 years, part of what little Indus water they got in the sabotaged and corrupt apportioning of water rights at partition. They desperately need the dam for irrigation, and they're elated and grateful for the US and World Bank money that finally came. The army is here as usual, with their bagpipes, their kilts, crisply starched khaki that defies the heat, and snappy salutes for any Westerner. I was amazed. I was a 30-year-old White House aide, uh, and I was being saluted by, uh, by Pakistani generals. And, and I didn't even get a salute in the green room here from the general. Um, <laughs> deference crackles like static electricity, up to a point. There is always something else. Behind the wail of the pipes, the band and the speeches, the roaring flyover of aged jet fighters that we last gave them, there is always a stillness. A stillness they hear, even if we do not. Pakistan is a nation born in death. On the eve of independence and partition in August 1947, the astrologers of the dissolving Raj warned everyone an inauspicious mating of the stars, they said, as if London's imperial policies were not enough. We Hindus will not be satisfied until every Muslim has been driven out of India, a leader of the coming genocide told a paper with venom that no one seemed to take seriously. It was not inevitable. For the convenience of the crown, the British deliberately incited a divide and rule Hindu-Muslim enmity through the first half of the century. They thought to ward off nationalism by cynically pushing to violent schism communities that had settled into relative peace despite their differences. And then drew the lines of partition with a cavalier haste, a political economic ignorance, and a cultural, ultimately racist insensibility, nothing less than criminal. By 1946, well before the national division was slashed, riots had already erupted. In Lahore, Rawalpindi, and elsewhere, there were terrible assaults on Hindus, Whatever the origin or proportion of outrage, however, the communal savaging of the Islamic minority, outnumbered on the subcontinent three to one, took a toll far beyond the horrors of the moment. I have heard so many stories from friends on both sides and tried often to imagine it. The approach of evening on the subcontinent, as the general knows, a fine gauzy dusk is subtle and slow with a startling, sudden cool at sundown, an unforgettable sense that burst from a darkening sky. But night, when it falls at last, pools like bottomless black water. Some Muslim families went through and remained waiting for that bottomless black water. An interminable wait, the cover for their fleeing, every moment listening for the terror of that first sharp report and then the relentlessly nearing bedlam of the mob. The passage ahead was even worse. Blood everywhere, the gutters and ditches ran with it. Trains the British had efficiently built and bequeathed trains the refugees thought would be safe were a swaying trap. Hindu killers pulled them screaming for mercy from the wagons and compartments. Hacked some to death on the siding, barricaded and burned alive whole carloads. At stop after stop, they turned waiting rooms into charnel houses. In unpublished photos of the aftermath that the CIA has in its files, the butchering daylight finally gone, lonely wreaths of station lights blink like unbelieving eyes at the bodies piled high on the platforms. His Majesty's remnant forces stood by as two million people of all faiths were slaughtered. 15 million driven from their homes, 75,000 women at least, that's, a, that's a, an, an underestimated number, most of them Muslim, raped. Soon the wild dogs of South Asia came right into the heart of the cities and towns after the dead and the helpless, snarling and parading their carrion. In the end, of course, 
there was only silence, the kind of quiet that comes up from the wells where they threw the children, silence that cannot be drowned out by bagpipes or by bands or by development loans or thundering jets. That silence is Pakistan's folk memory. They go on hearing it, even if we never do. Dragged like refugees from India, wrenched from the trains, bandaged together like survivors who made it to the demarcation line, this is a scarred and festering state. Humiliated and defiant, wretched and treasured, Pakistan hovers at a border it can never quite get across, a Manichaean frontier between good and evil. So many of the little boys who huddled trembling next to their mothers on one of those last trains to Karachi, who glimpsed the fly-covered corpses, who felt the lurch of the train as it stopped for bodies along the tracks, went on to become the soldiers of that new nation. Along with Muslim veterans of the old British Indian Army, they would be the chokidars to the oligarchs. The chokidars are, are the watchmen of South Asia. They're on the, on the roof uh, watching your house at night. Uh, and the feudal landlords who inherited the wounded country's post-colonial power. And when all the internal stresses and divisions cordoned into this fugitive sovereignty, patched together around common faith, tore like scavengers at Muhammad Ali Jinnah's elegant dream of Islamic democracy, threatening to unleash a reigning chaos that would leave them prey again to the Hindus, the soldiers gladly seized power themselves. From its birth trauma alone, Pakistan seemed doomed for a time to be a garrison state psychologically, if not politically. Though haunted by some nemesis of vengeance, it repeatedly lost its ever longed for, ever prepared for wars. Wary of any power but their own, the earnest young officers, protectors and avengers of the persecuted, turned out one of the world's largest armies and the longest running military dictatorship on earth. Their crisp khaki eventually went clammy with abuse and corruption and with an ugly sectarianism harbored like a mutant contagion deep in their own ranks. Pakistan, so hopefully named the chaste land, which is what it means in Urdu, Pakistan, the pure haven, gone impure after all. They made it so. They and their ever agreeable, heedless patron, the United States. We funded Pakistani police and intelligence torturers beginning in the mid-1950s and we're soon training them in more efficient means with our Office of Public Safety, a CIA front under cover of AID until quietly disbanded by bipartisan writer in 1975 after complicity in torture was exposed in Latin America, in Asia, in a way even too naked for Congress to ignore. The Office of Public Safety, one of the first of our many uh, imperial misnomers. No public was safe in dungeons where we so inventively helped our allies to defend the free world. There is, of course, a reincarnation three decades later in the post-9-11 world, uh, the War on Terror, with the CIA's Special Access Program, SAP, SAP. Isn't that wonderful? It carries out rendition of suspected terrorists to the much-used and much-scrubbed-down interrogation chambers of our old clients, Pakistan, Egypt, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. As our British colonial forebears who solemnly abjured torture in the Raj as elsewhere in Pax Britannica while enjoying its use indirectly, that means simply having the natives do the job for you, American policymakers, diplomats, and CIA men have hired help for this kind of thing. The OPS recruited ex-cops and assorted gumshoes from small town, subdivision, and trailer court America, men of bravery and patriotism rippling free of any education or knowledge of foreign affairs, and sent them off to Montevideo, Saigon, Riyadh, Rawalpindi, and beyond. To outsource the latest torture, the 21st century SAP hires contractors of the same breed from the same large stagnant mercenary pool left by the Cold War and by police force early retirement. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, the complicity in repression by the United States was only beginning. 
along with discrepancies in development money and weapons aid and sales, bribes, kickback, kickbacks, siphoning, and irrepressible resales that will be part of the winked at cost of doing business east of the Khyber. We justified it all by the Soviet threat, but of course, the Soviets never really threatened Pakistan at all. But there were other compelling reasons. The perfect match of twisted perceptions and so of silences. The Pakistanis needing above all a powerful patron against India, America nervously coveting third world allies among otherwise generally sullen nationalists, an urge all the greater after the Iraqi puppet monarchy falls in 1958, and the Shahs, Iran, and Pakistan, who will be our two historic failures in the region haunting us today, seem our only appreciative friends, Iran and Pakistan, think of it, our only appreciative friends from the Persian Gulf to the Gulf of Siam. Not least, there is the congenital endophobia of Washington politicians, and it's still there, the deep distaste at the uppity, independent, intellectually daunting Indian elite. The shining remnant of India's democracy was always less important than their seeming insolence of manner and policy. From the 1960s on then, there is so much worse to come with Pakistan than torture and absconded aid. We will patronize, partner with, and protect the inimitable Bank of Commerce and Credit International and its worldwide empire of drugs and corruption. While publicly regretting it, even sanctioning them for it, and branding ourselves as hypocritical, treacherous, ultimately uh, undependable friends, we will blithely help build the Pakistan nuclear arsenal, financed in part by that drug money with millions in restricted high-tech materials illegally bought inside the U.S. with the collusion of the U.S. government from the White House to the Pentagon to the Central Intelligence Agency. And then there is the wonderful Afghan civil war of the 1980s and Al-Qaeda. We could never hear Pakistan's silence in the din of our own fears and machinations, only take cynical advantage of their birth defect, as we always do and still do. Pakistan, the indispensable, ever-excused ally against the Soviets and wavering third world nationalist. Pakistan, the indispensable, ever-excused ally against terrorists. We imagine no better future or function for them than as another hired mercenary, our very own sepoys. We are powerful enough to brush past it all, except, of course, the nuclear weapons. As for the Pakistanis, for all the gratitude uh, they feel and the need to arm against India, they carry, I have always seen, a raging resentment at the relationship with America, a partnership that can never really be equal, and in the provincial politics of the two sides, never honest. They know this more consciously than we do. They court our help, sometimes beg for it, and they hate it, hate us, hate themselves for wanting it. They know that in our mutual exploitation, we have enabled them to abandon their own founding dream to their worst fears. Like the Afghans and the Indians, they are indomitably independent, proud, in many ways, more civilized than we are. Yet they can never admit how much they would like to be rid of us. Some of them may join the relatively few glassy-eyed young fanatics rocking in the madrasas, though more lethal hatred seeds and metastasizes in the college and other Western-educated middle class, men like some of those 9-11 planners and hijackers who take the measure of the past and the present in a more sophisticated way. With the culture's gift for omens, there were some who saw it all and wanted it to happen. Chodhawe Ramat Ali was a brilliant Muslim zealot who studied at Cambridge as an older man. He despised Hindus. He wrote fiery tracts before World War II about a separate Pakistan. He advocated a pan-Islamic state to take in not only the Punjab, the Sindh, Baluchistan, and the Northwest and Kashmir, but what he also called Afghania and portions of Iran and Turkey all by way of a martial nationalism, well-armed, a sustaining alliance with an expedient but heedless great power, guess who, and the resurgence of a primitive reactionary Islam. Ali at the time uh, was regarded as a raving madman. Jinnah and the Muslim League shunned him 
after partition, he stayed in Cambridge for a while and then died in 1950, an obscure fanatic. History had surely passed by. Tragically, he was a visionary. I would like to say that, that, uh, that there is real hope uh, for peace on the subcontinent. Um, I don't really believe that for a moment. Uh, I don't think there's hope for, uh, for any new uh, revolutionary, and it will take a revolutionary change, a revolutionary sensibility in American foreign policy. We continue to be, uh, in dealing with all of these societies we are fond of calling tribal, relentlessly tribal ourselves. We view the, the non-Western world in, with a tribal orientalism, which uh, traces fundamentally to a, a, a racist and, and prejudiced view of these people, as well as, of course, uh, an abiding ignorance of culture, of politics, of their, of their very worth as human beings. I wish I could say that we will, uh, we will stop our machinations that are at the root of most of the evil in, uh, in Afghanistan today. We are the country that, uh, by our covert actions, very largely provoked the Soviet invasion of, uh, uh, of December 1979. Uh, we are the country that armed, uh, quite consciously and quite deliberately, but then again quite heedlessly, uh, the, the Mujahideen who were, we knew, uh, from our own experience, our own reporting, you can look at the archives of the American cable traffic, we knew were, uh, were medieval atavists who not only threw acid in the face of young women at Kabul University, uh, but whose vision of the future for Afghanistan was, uh, was really was quite, quite at odds with anything we pretended to stand for in the world. And you'll remember that Ronald Reagan called them the moral equivalent of our founding fathers. I wish I could say that we would address honestly the, the, uh, the incredible criminal dimension of all of this, which is to say that, that uh, Pakistan itself uh, has a, a black economy that may be in some respects even larger than its public economy, and it's based very, very substantially on the drug trade. Uh, the Afghan regime, if it can be called that, and you know he's called, Karzai is only the mayor of Kabul, and only, only then, uh, by a few hours in daylight, with his American mercenary guards, uh, is, uh, is really a narco-republic in every sense of the term. Uh, and it, uh, it became that, again, after the Taliban had, uh, had largely erased the drug trade, it became that with the conscious and deliberate sponsorship and collusion of the American government. Almost nothing you hear, see, read publicly about American foreign policy in South Asia is true. There is a, there is a parallel universe, as there is in all of, of American foreign policy, a parallel universe in which uh, the real world functions with money, with corruption, with, uh, with what is regarded very largely as criminal activity, at least in the United States, even though it's business as usual in much of the rest of the world, uh, and with, uh, with a vast and a absolutely bottomless hypocrisy by American politicians. It knows no partisan distinctions. That hypocrisy is practiced as glibly, and in fact, in some ways more so, by the Democrats uh, as by the Republicans. And uh, there is absolutely no evidence, I have to tell you, with all sobriety, there is no evidence that any of this will change with this new administration. Um, now, I, I, I know that after this upbeat presentation, <laughs> you'll, um, you, will have, you will have questions and comments and, and maybe even arrest warrants, but uh, <laughs> um, I wanted, to, I wanted to give you a, uh, a presentation with the bark off because I think that the, the stakes here are so enormously high. There is no good exit from Afghanistan. If we leave, we leave it to a long night of barbarism that will shock the sensibility of generations to come. If we stay, we will sacrifice uh, American lives and our, our very considerably dwindling fortune for purposes that are, that are vague and undefined and probably unattainable. 
Uh, there are no good options in Afghanistan, and there are really no good options in Pakistan. This is an awful, terrible mess that we have made, we have contributed so much to, and we cannot fix it anytime soon. We are stuck with it. And we are stuck not just with a mess, but with a nuclear armed mess, which as you saw as those, uh, those guys with the AK-47s uh, uh, ran through the lobby of the, of the hotel in Mumbai, um, is quite volatile. A few men with uh, the ability and the willingness to sacrifice their own lives can set two nuclear armed nations uh, at odds with one another with a few hours work. And, uh, and I don't even want to get into that until the question period. Thank question. you. Okay. <clears throat> So, do you two gentlemen have anything to say to each other? Because I think we might move quickly to Q&A, uh, but do have an exchange, if you will. I'm sort of speechless to ask questions here. <laughs> no, I, I think I'll only make one word. I, I'm reminded of uh, uh, a quote from President Eisenhower, who said, no pessimist has ever won a war. I cannot agree with that uh, degree of pessimism that my co-speaker has said. So I have, I have to live with optimism, that's all. Any last words before we go to Q&A? Well, um, I, I don't think it's a war. Um, I think that, uh, I, I think this is, this is almost an existential crisis. For the, uh, for the United States, as well as for Pakistan and for India and for Afghanistan. Um, this, is a, this world is, is so largely of our making. It is so largely a product uh, of the Cold War. It is so largely a product of our approach to the rest of the planet that um, I think we have to see it in entirely different and new terms in order to, in order to heal it. Uh, I don't want to fight it. I want to heal it. So let's get the microphones working here on the right. OK. The gentleman there with his hand, not in front, but in the back there. There you go. Hi. Uh, good evening. Um, I have a question that's not absolutely directly related to this discussion. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to bring this up. Uh, I wanted to ask all three of you gentlemen um, if you are aware of what World Trade Center Building 7 is. Oh, please. Okay. Take the microphone away. This is, this is truly um, hijacking this is, the discussion. This is a very important topic, no, and I it's, think it's that we need insane. to begin talking about this. Take, would you please take the microphone um, away from this fellow? World Trade Center Building No, no, no. We just don't need to have these, hijacks, 11th, these discussions hijacked by... And it was brought down in a controlled Could you please take the microphone from him? discuss this. Um, excuse we me. don't want to be, look, I just want to bring up you an idiots topic that we experienced an interesting presentation. All you care about is your own little minor obsession. It is truly hijacking an important discussion. Right. Uh, can we get rid of these people? And, and can you give up the microphone there? Before, I'll, I'll take it from you. No, there's no, oh. Could we, could we have somebody here that actually is interested in tonight's discussion? Yes. This, this gentleman over here with his cell phone up. The gentleman with his cell phone up. Hi. This question is actually for the general. I was actually wondering if peace is in the interest, in the true interest, in the genuine interest of Pakistan and the Indian governments, if that's actually in their true interest. Do they actually benefit and do they actually want to achieve that? Or is this just a cat and mouse game that's going on? Please. General? I'm kind of surprised with the question, you know. I mean, um, of course, I mean, peace is the end point of any relationship. Peace is the end point. I'm as a military officer. I have fought war as a teenager. 
You have no idea what the face of war is like. You got to be there to find out what it is like. And you know what? Even as the war ended, I'm talking about between India and Pakistan. I'm talking about 1971. As a second lieutenant, the day the war ended, we were exchanging maps with each other, telling each other that right, you know, where we planted the landmines. I'm giving my map to the Indians to remove the landmine before a villager steps out there. This is the natural thing out there. And that army that across, we fought professionally, but we never hated each other across a line like that. I'm telling you the honest truth. The Pakistani and the Indian Air Forces, they did not target civilian population. They fought civilized war there. This is the real face of there. Of course, there, there are organizations, there are industrial, there are complexes that benefit from rivalry. Just like they benefited here. You know the history of America, the whole Cold War. The whole military industrial juggernaut was beneficiary of this. So there are organizational elements whose interest is always there. But in the larger interest of state relations, they look ahead of these things. Today, like I mentioned in my talk, the issues that India and Pakistani people face, you know, there is no choice left with them. There will be no water out there. There will be no food out there. There will be no energy to, to, to run uh, anything. India may rise, but without energy, it won't do this. And there will be no end to terrorism if they don't behave well today. I tell you this. It is incumbent on India and Pakistan to peace. They have no choice left. And it is not for the armies to decide. It is for the state and the system to decide. And that's all I can say. Thank you. Can, can I just address that very briefly? I, I think that, that uh, the general is absolutely right. There are, there are very powerful vested interests uh, on both sides that are vested in this, in this rivalry. But um, there's also a, a very strong political component to the, to the enmity. And uh, what you need, it seems to me, on the Indian side is a Gorbachev to, uh, to really change things from the top down, to lead India to the kind of concession it's going to have to make. The, the, the core of the issue here is Kashmir. Kashmir needs to be autonomous, needs to be, needs to be taken out of the mix. No Indian government is ready to do that yet. And I see nothing on the political horizon in India that would indicate a readiness to to do that, and no Pakistani government is going to cut a deal that will last on the subcontinent without, without a Kashmir settlement. Take a question from this side here. The gentleman over here in the, in the thank you. Uh, this question is primarily for the, the general, but your, the others are welcome to comment. Uh, there's talk about negotiating with the Taliban, and I'm wondering, uh, is, that, is that realistic? Is it possible? Are there any moderate Talib Talibani or Talibans to, to uh, negotiate with? What does that look like? Uh, the brief answer is yes, there are. And in fact, the bond process of 2002, the biggest mistake of that bond process was that when there were Talibans to be brought on the table, they were not brought. The result is what we see today. Of course, you can always talk to them. Uh, there are people. At the end of the day, you have to speak to somebody. You can't kill 25 million Pashtuns out there. You can't do that. You have to figure that out. And of course, the, the, uh, there are, there are uh, much more people uh, who, whom you can talk with them. And uh, at the end of the day, some, somebody has to come on the table to do that. That's my very brief answer. Um, can you bring the microphone down to the f very bottom here, on this side? <clears throat> yes. As complex, as complex as all these issues are, what should the United States be doing to help things out? <laughs> We're, we're, well, we'll talk to a resident uh, pessimist here. <laughs> uh, I, I think it would be helpful if we published a white paper, which would uh, which would detail in part our responsibility for what for what has happened. It might it might help to clear the air and uh, establish a new tone of of honesty in the in the dialogue. Um, 
there are, I think, uh, very knowledgeable people in this country who know, who know Afghanistan and who know Pakistan and India. Unfortunately, they're not be, uh, on the payroll of the federal government or likely, likely to be. They need to be brought, brought into the process in a, in a systematic way. President Obama needs a, a kitchen cabinet desperately on, on this issue. Uh, and not not the the courtiers and the and the usual think tank hangers on in in Washington, uh, the people who are who are really thoughtful are are not in that in that category. So you, you, are you referring to Richard Holbrook? Well, <laughs> I, 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 I as you know I know Dick Holbrook very well. I can't imagine anybody less qualified to negotiate a, a, a settlement in South Asia, uh, but. Um, if you ask for for positive things to do, I, I think the United States would would uh, should should lead an international effort to address the the, the Kashmir issue. I think the United States should uh, should lead an international effort to stop uh, eradicate the drug trade in Afghanistan, which means incidentally cutting off the the CIA payroll, most of the of the drug lords in the country, and uh, we we really have to, we need to install a new government. In, in Kabul. Now, th those are all very, very radical things, but they're all things that, that could and, and should be done. Um, is there a chance of that happening? No. Can I just say one? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just right up at the top. Go ahead. Take the mic up to the top. Uh, just a brief uh, comment to that. Never before in the history of South Asia, the United States had influence and leverage over Kabul. Islamabad and Delhi at the same time. This is the first time in history that this has happened. There is no reason why the United States cannot do anything. I do not see any reason. What I have sort of implied in my talk was that the United States is not doing anything. It, what it can do, it does not do. What it does is it takes a fire extinguisher and runs to the country and then puts a fire and then comes back. That's what they do. That's what uh, Secretary of State did last week. This is exactly what uh, Rick Armitage did in 2002. They ran into the area, oh, oh, don't fight, don't fight, that's all. And that's the, that's the end of story. <laughs> Unless and until you get a handle of this whole thing, and I have argued and I'll repeat that what I said that, India-Pakistan rivalry is directly affecting the U.S. war on terror and this rivalry must come to an end. Regardless of what, whichever way it goes, it must come to an end. And that includes Kashmir and other packages. This rivalry is no longer tolerable because, you know, you just see what happened in Mumbai. The result of that is that it was such a fragile peace process, it just broke down. India and Pakistan have not been able to solve anything bilaterally. Pakistan and Afghanistan have failed to solve anything bilaterally. India and China have failed to solve anything bilaterally. Which one country in South Asian region and neighbors have been able to solve in 60 years on their own? Hegemony, no hegemony, big power, small power, nothing. They cannot solve the issues bilaterally. And therefore, uh, loath to somebody coming in, remaining, oh my God, it's my nationalism, don't come and talk to me, you know, I'm a big guy. You got to see that, you know, who is affected in the end. I teach students in, in Naval Postgrad School. Bulk of them, they go onto the harm's way and they're fighting in Afghanistan. I know these 20-something, what they do, and I, I feel for them. Because when they're being thrown into the area where Others are supposed to take the responsibilities. They don't. That's all I would say. Yes, the lady in the back there. Uh, thank you. I, I guess uh, Mr. Morris seemed to paint a really gloomy picture of Pakistan. I was wondering uh, if uh, the general would like to say something about the democratic elections in Pakistan, the lawyers' movement in Pakistan. That was quite exciting movement and all the eyes were on Pakistan last year. I mean, we shouldn't, as horrible as the events in Mumbai are, we shouldn't forget everything that's been going on in Pakistan the last few years. And then also for Mr. Morris, I was wondering, what is your evidence that the United States provoked Soviet action in 1979 in Afghanistan? Thank you. Let's we'll start with Roger's answer to that question. Well, there's, a, um, there's now a very, very substantial archival record of, uh, of the United States uh, engaging in, uh, in covert intervention in Afghanistan, even uh, long before the, uh, the communists came to power in April of 1978. We were engaged with 
the Bhutto government in Pakistan against uh, the Daoud regime, Mohammed Daoud, who was the Afghan ruler before the communists took power uh, to destabilize Afghanistan. This was part of Henry Kissinger's diplomacy. It was, it was part of a joint effort with the Chinese, with the then Shah of Iran, and with, with Pakistan. And Pakistan, incidentally, was, was a favorite American client of, of Richard Nixon. They had treated him so well out of office and given him full honors when he was being ignored and dissed by, by everyone else, and he loved the Pakistanis. And you remember that, that they facilitated the first secret trip that Kissinger made to Beijing uh, and the world-shaking diplomacy that, that flowed from that. But uh, the Carter regime is the, is the root of all evil here. Uh, it was the Carter regime that began uh, active support of the Mujahideen and uh, fomenting uh, the civil war in Afghanistan. Uh, it, it, it probably, we, we d we're not sure of the, uh, of the first off-the-books off uh, operations, but they probably took place in the spring of, uh, of 1978, uh, within 60 days of, of the communist regime taking power, shortly after a trip that Brzezinski made to, to Beijing. We know that, that the Chinese became very active then and that the CIA was at least in informal context. The United States uh, helped arm and foment an uprising in Herat in western Afghanistan uh, early in 1979 uh, that was the largest slaughter of foreign aid uh, workers in the history of, of development aid. It happened in this case, of course, to be, uh, to be Russian workers. Uh, not only Russian workers, but also their attending families, the babushki and the children who were brought along. This was an exception in the Soviet aid, aid program uh, in Afghanistan. Um, the, we know that, that there, were formal, there was a formal approval by President Carter in July of 1979. This is six months before the, uh, the Soviet invasion. And we know there is a long and, and tortuous record of uh, American diplomatic provocations of the Soviet Union uh, up to and including the invasion. The Politburo was, was deathly averse to invading Afghanistan and had rejected, specifically rejected, calls by the Afghan government to intervene on four or five different occasions during 1978, 1979. The Americans were under terrific pressure from Mohammed Zia, who was the military dictator in Pakistan. We were under, uh, we were under terrific pressure uh, to do something, of course, uh, by all the exile groups that were, uh, that were in Pakistan along the border. These were the radical Islamists that we now, we now uh, love and, and, and support, the, the Northern Alliance, the, at least the forefathers of the Northern Alliance. Uh, and, and that covert intervention began in earnest uh, in, in that July, at the very time when Jimmy Carter was meeting with Leonid Brezhnev and swearing that the United States didn't have anything to do with, with uh, outside intervention in Afghanistan. It's a long trail of blatant lies and misrepresentations. And, uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, you'll have to read my book, the, uh, the Soviets very reluctantly and on the assumption that the United States was concluding a secret pact with the Afghan communist government, uh, which was at odds with the Soviets, it's another whole story, uh, in, in which we had encouraged them to believe. Uh, uh, and it's all built around, incidentally, even more intrigue because we were after uh, replacement uh, espionage facilities, electronic listening posts that we had lost in Iran when the Shah toppled in January of 1979. It's a very tangled story. It's a very nasty one, but uh, we, were, we were certainly in part responsible for the Soviet invasion. Did they blunder? Did they, were they evil? Did they, did they commit terrible atrocities? Of course. Yes, they did, and we were party to it. And uh, General Kahn, the question was about the, the lawyers' movement uh, and how it, it exemplified uh, democratic energy and spirit inside of Pakistan. Well, I think I think the question the judge put is absolutely right in, in, in some sense. That, that indicates the nature of society in Pakistan, c contrary to the kind of you know, stereotype images here that you know at every nook and corner of Pakistan, there's a mullah running amok with crazy things. That, that's not quite true. I mean, it's 160 plus million people. And the civil society is vibrant. The positive side of this whole thing was that they did not take it down easily when it comes to, uh, comes to certain norms and principles. The negative side was that they stretched it too much. They stretched it to a point 
where instability of the state was none of their concern, and that continues to be the case even today. So that's, that's, that's when you stretch it far too much. You know the problem, I often tell my student, Pakistan is like a Rubik's Cube, you know, you said one thing right, the other thing is wrong, you know, you just keep on playing like this. This is exactly what was doing the lawyers' movement, that the politicians wanted their access, the lawyers wanted their utopia, they didn't get it in the end, the movement is still going on, you know that. And it was, it was a tragedy of sorts to look into Pakistan that on one square in, in, in Pakistan, there's a three-star general who's been killed by a suicide bomber who blew himself on his car. And just about a mile on the same road in Rawalpindi, the lawyer movement is saying, oh, we want our Chaudhary back, we want so-and-so back. Totally disconnected. Totally disconnected as if it's not the same body politic. There were, you know, there was a Red Mosque incident uh, last year in 2007, if you're familiar with. It took guts to go into the heart of Islamabad to go and do what they did. And first of all, the whole civil society kept on telling the armed forces, oh, you have done this, which is true. They, they actually, uh, they, they tolerated them, they actually supported them. That mosque was doing a lot of dirty things all over uh, as well in the past. But that was state that was doing that. And then you wanted to finish them. When the military goes into the operation, all human rights violation groups were standing all there, telling the militaries, you know, you people are not doing anything, look at these people. The day the military finished the operation, they were the first one to raise flag. Oh my God. All my children and kids, women and kids. These women were armed. They were standing and threatening to threaten the state. The, you know, it's like a babble. No one knows who's a martyr in that country. Can you imagine a soldier going and knowing whether he's going to be treated as dead or is he's going to be treated as a dog? I've been a soldier of that country. It's the worst possible thing that can happen. And the lawyer movement was not moving an inch on that. So you can see how much damage they did in the process. But the good part was that in the end, they did show to the world and they did show to the people and to the military of the country that they don't tolerate. And this is the first time in Pakistan history they forced the military to get back peacefully and they retreated back. This doesn't happen in, in a society. Professor Steve Cohen, when he met me last year, said, well, this is a kind of an orange revolution in Pakistan. It was not bloody. It could have been bloody. The military could have done anything. It's very powerful. So these are some good points that come out from Pakistan at the same time, but we must remember that what damage we also did to the whole state in that process as well. The whole picture will be complete when you analyze both sides of the story. Thank you. There's a gentleman here in the middle that, in the white jacket on your um, left there. Uh, I wanted to uh, say that uh, the term uh, terrorism is kind of defined outside of Afghanistan ideologically, whereas inside of Afghanistan it's uh, defined ethnically. And uh, I put my neck on the line on September 16, 2001, saying that we should negotiate with the Taliban and there are moderate ones among them. And uh, it was on a live radio program and that's why they couldn't cut me off. But uh, the point is that they didn't do it then they don't do it now because it serves a purpose. And the purpose is that we need an enemy and that you cannot ignore 60% of a nation's population and, and kind of uh, through a broad brush identify every Pashtun as a terrorist and keep bombing them whether it's through drones or, or whatever. And that's, we create this, the instability that, that is currently existent in Afghanistan. And I, I think uh, the, uh, the solution would be, uh, if, if anyone really wants to take it into consideration, I think like Mr. Morris suggested earlier, is that if we talk to those with whom we have grievance, apparently we talk to them still only through the barrel of a gun, and that's why there is no solution. Uh, I'm sorry, this is more like a comment, but uh, you may comment on the comment if you wish. Thank you. Any response? Oh, there is response. Well, I, I must say I, I agree with that. I think it's much more complex now than it was uh, in those first months after 9-11. Uh, after we, we have created, um, uh, as the Bush administration was fond of saying, we're, we're creating reality. We've created a new reality in, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and the war there has taken, a, has taken an awful toll. Uh, and I, the general is quite right. There are lots of Taliban's. 
Uh, it's, it, it's a complex movement. If anything, it, it's probably stronger politically than it was when it was a government. Uh, and, that's, and that's very formidable. But I think it, the, the bottom line here is you have to ask, what are we going to talk about? And uh, what kind of Afghanistan would you have after a negotiated settlement with these people? And it will not be an Afghanistan you'll want to see on CNN at night or that you'll want to hear discussed by left or right on Fox or MSNBC. Uh, that the plight of women and human rights in general and the state of justice and uh, the whole fate of democracy will, uh, will not make you happy. Uh, we've, we've created, uh, helped to create here a, a, a much worse nightmare than anything we faced in the, in the 1980s in Afghanistan. We deliberately destroyed, deliberately destroyed the secular democratic alternative, both in exile and in the, in the country. And um, we're paying the price for that. In the back there, where's, the, where's that microphone? I just, um, part question, quick comment. Um, as a solution, I'm Iranian-American. I follow uh, Caucasus and South Asian and Middle Eastern geopolitics obsessively. Um, there was a natural gas pipeline that is still in consideration from uh, the southern uh, Persian Gulf coast of Iran through Pakistan into India, aptly titled the Peace Pipeline which Washington and London are adamantly against. There's a pipeline deal that China wants to stretch from mainland China through Pakistan to the coast of Pakistan, which I'm sure the general is aware of. Again, which London and Washington, and really New York, the NYMEX, are extreme, you know, definitively against. Uh, why are we not talking about energy and pipeline politics, which I sense strongly uh, underpin uh, certainly Washington and Zbigniew Brzezinski's geopolitical strategy in the Caucasus, in the stand states, in South Asia, and separately but potentially relatedly, the Mumbai massacre, how could it, if in any way, potentially serve the mid to long term geopolitical interests of London and Washington? Both, if you could address both, the, the pipeline issues, if we can sit, when the gentleman said talk to our adversaries, sit at the table with the Iranians, the Chinese, the Russians, the Indians, and the Pakistanis to see if there's an apt way to have energy convergence as far as interest rather than everything be an Anglo-American map as if it's 1946. And then separately, and not to sound like the guys around me necessarily, but did the Mumbai issue potentially serve the counter of those type of interests, namely purposefully in a Hobbesian fashion to cause you know, instability by necessity? General. Yeah. I, I, think, I think the very purpose of that incident was to cause instability. And it, it showed how fragile the relation was. And they did succeed in that, to that extent, to the last part of your, 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 your comment. About the energy security, uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, Indian, Iran, India, Pakistan, uh, India pipeline would have gone along uh, until the US intervened into that. Now we know what, it, what happened. And then they were offering nuclear deal to India. So India was easily, you know, India showed less interest because they wanted that deal to in their pocket. Otherwise, that would have jeopardized the nuclear deal in the process. And the Iranians quickly picked that up that this is going to be the case. Uh, End of the day, sooner or later, that has to happen. You see, uh, the energy demand of China and India together, as they rise with that, the amount of growth that you, you're seeing, the whole Afro-Indian, uh, Af African continent and the Indian Ocean, this is going to be the hub of maritime activities and pipelines. This is, in, you know, you just can't stop that. And when Central Asia came out of the yoke of Soviet Union, we all thought that there is a lot of energy out there, and that's going to move east and west and both. But once you have this resource problem, then geopolitics takes its course. I mean, this is you got to be realist out there. You know, you, you cannot. We can't live in the world of utopia. The idea is to deny China energy because if you deny China energy, uh, this that's the only way you can contain them. So these are long-term sort of thing that goes on. Chinese have a Shanghai Cooperation Organization. You know, 
that they believe, and, and, and Americans, you know, exaggerated fear is that this is the NATO of the East of sort, but their concern is Tibet and Xinjiang and the impact of, you know, instability in Central Asia, how that will affect China. And it's a little more exaggeration about the energy security about China because Pakistan borders China on Xinjiang province. Mainland China is out there. And Chinese are looking into Angola and other places for that energy, uh, of, of what they want to do. Uh, that's going to go straight into the Chinese Sea. There's going to be more maritime activities. And therefore, the more maritime activities on this oil and energies will go, you need to take care of the pirates. You need to take care of, secure the sea lands of communication. So it says a lot more is going to happen in the 21st century, not just land pipelines. It's very uh, expensive to preposition. But end of the day, energy politics will determine. That's why I was making a point in my, that energy security is far more greater than borders which are here or there. It doesn't matter. You know, line of control of Kashmir can go 10 miles up and down. Who cares now? You know, really, who cares now? But we do, while, while the whole world was, you know, worried about where Sarah Palin is buying her clothes from, the Kashmiris were dying and protest, you know, in Srinagar at the same very time. Nobody was focused. What happened in Kashmir in last six months? And I'm not trying to really, you know, say, nobody focused what happened. They, were, they did not pick up arms. They were doing peaceful protest. They were brutalized. No, no reporter has gone except for BBC. Nobody talked. New York Times didn't talk of it. LA Times doesn't bother about it. Even Pakistani media didn't even care about it because they wanted to show the olive branch to India. But the Kashmiris were screaming and yelling at the same time. So, you know, every, there's a price to pay. Then when people get fed up, then, then this kind of Mumbai kind of things will happen. I'm not saying that necessarily that is linked because, because <coughs> we still don't know that. We still don't know that, what happened. But the world is not focused on the things that happen, you know. That's all. Can, can I? Go ahead. Yeah, just let me say that that uh, I, I agree completely. Kashmir is an, is an Indian problem, and it has to be solved in in Delhi. Uh, but you know, it, it, so much money has changed hands. You just you just have to imagine uh, the, the the bribe money and the uh, the unaccounted dollars that are flowing in, in the Northwest to, to, and all over the subcontinent these days to know which faction of which faction of which rump group of which. Uh, breakaway uh, segment uh, is doing what for what reason? Uh, I mean, we really are. We, we're dealing with Al Capone, Chicago, and it's to the nth power, and um, and many of them are on the American payroll for one reason or another. It seemed like a good idea at the time. They would say in Langley, and um, so that that if if you could trace back genealogically, if you could trace back uh, Mumbai to uh, to some. Uh, splinter group or to or to factions or individuals who had relationships with MI6 or with the CIA, it would not astonish me in the slightest. Is that a matter of national policy? No, uh, it's a matter of the of the cultural disaster that we have wrought uh, in that part of the world by by such heedless pursuit of of other means. But but let me say that the pipeline is uh, is my, is my dream. Uh, I'm not. I'm only a pessimist in the short run, which is that is the life of most people in this room. Um, in the in the long run, in the long run, there will be a common market in South Asia. In the long run, somebody will at last pay attention to the economic development of Afghanistan. They won't have to grow opium poppies. In, in the long run, uh, it will be dominated not by the United States or even by Western Europe, but by Russia, uh, and in some kind of partnership with China. Uh, and in the long run, they'll all get along much better. But uh, in the long, in that long run, we will all be dead. And I thought we were addressing uh, the, what could be immediately done here, po politically speaking. And we're a long way away from that for for the very reasons that the general was saying. There's uh, the Indians have to come to grips with Kashmir, and uh, the two countries have to come together, and the United States has to change its ways. The 9-11 Commission report did recommend something to that effect, not quite using the word Marshall Plan. But I don't think it was truly implemented the way they recommended. It was a committee, bipartisan committee. I think now about it's about time that, you know, whosoever this gentleman is, if, if it is Rachel Horbrook, he must go and, and, and come back and with these answers, exactly what you have said. 
There is there's just no two way left about this. However, I may have a slight uh, sort of a comment on this, uh, maybe because of my security background. You cannot throw in Marshall Plan and money where you do not have a bare minimum security. You know, you have to have a fence. You have to have some level of stability and security when you start throwing. Otherwise, it really will be going into a black hole. You got to have some semblance of thing before it starts. And there is no strategy we can be complete without this economic package in the end. But unfortunately, uh, until and unless the security forces bring about an environment in which this package can, can, can take shape, it, there's a danger that the money will just go away. And then we'll have another explanation to say why it didn't happen. You know? so, so that's what I say, that it, at this point of time, uh, this package has to, this has to be really a combined political strategy, and it's, it will not be easy. Uh, it won't be very easy for President Obama, I can tell you. Uh, but but his heart, I think, is right. His intentions are right. He is talked about the change, and this is the change. What the Council General has suggested. I would only like to add this little thing in that. Um, I, I think it's the greatest single failure of the American body politic not to come to grips with, with what 9-11 really represented. Uh, of course, of course, terrorists have uh, agendas. Uh, terrorists do not uh, attack us because of our freedoms. They don't, uh, they don't commit suicide. Uh, several young men don't, don't drive jets at 500 miles an hour into skyscrapers uh, just to, just to uh, uh, play with virgins in, uh, in the afterlife. This is a, this is the product, this is the product of a, of a political era and the product of very deliberate uh, American policies. And 9-11 um, I saw, and said so at the time, to not very much acclaim, 9-11 uh, was a counterattack in a, in a war that most Americans never knew they were in, but which had been waged in their name uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere for, for a very long while. And, and the same thing is true in, uh, in Pakistan. Uh, those terrorists do have agendas. And um, I don't think that'll be satisfied anytime soon. I agree with the general. I think it's, it's become a security problem, but, uh, but it's a quintessential political problem. Uh, they, they have to, uh, they, we, we have to find a way to deal with, uh, with the, uh, the, the political grievances that are still there. In, uh, in South Asia. And, uh, and that may mean Pakistan somehow surrendering some of the sovereignty that it is so jealously protected in the, in the Northwest Territories. You know that the, the Pashtun and the Pathan are, are, uh, are, are, are divided people. You know that that boundary was established by the British and, and that it's become one of the most malignant frontiers uh, in the history of the planet. And we may have to, uh, uh, we may have to address, I'm talking about the, the Afghan-Pakistan border. We may have to address that uh, that issue uh, if we're ever going to have uh, a solution to this problem. And and is development, as the as the consul general suggested, uh, a way to go? Oh, I, I I think while we're addressing the security issues and the political issues, absolutely, I'm uh, I'd be in favor of a, of a Marshall Plan. I want to see the the Afghans deserve whatever we can give them. I want to see them driving these Bentleys that I see all over Brentwood and and. Uh, 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 in I'm Los Angeles, I, I mean, I, we, no, no people, they, they've been against the world. No people has suffered more at the hands of the great powers. And I don't mean just the United States, but I mean everybody. Everybody's been, been, uh, been picking at the Afghans low these many years. The Russians, the Saudis, the Israelis, the, 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 the Pakistanis, everybody, everybody. So they, they deserve whatever we could give them, but of course we can't afford it now. That's uh, just a there's a lady down here on the on your right in the fifth row. Hi. Since this is so much blowback, historical layer upon layer of blowback, I'm wondering: Have either of you read of a non-Western, um, more of a non-Western solution of a coalition, such as was suggested as a Marshall Plan, but with more elements because Afghanistan and Pakistan are so very different and you have so many powerful interests in the region. I'm wondering if, if either of you in your readings have seen any plausible solutions coming out of 
the non-Western world. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I know the Japanese at one point wanted to own all of that real estate. Um, you know, the, um, the simple answer is that I think that, that uh, the sooner the United States exits from that world, politically and, and certainly and militarily, um, the, the better the chance will be that we will find, uh, a, that that world will find a solution, a non-Western solution. Um, and that doesn't mean exit, exit with our money. I think, we, I think we owe them a blood debt. Pakistan and when we, we, we've spent billions in Pakistan, but it's all gone to the wrong people. And, and so we've wasted it, and that's been our responsibility. And uh, I, I think the, the, the sooner we get out, the better chance they have. Okay. Could you bring the microphone down here to the fifth row, the, the lady here with the hand up? There. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm Pakistani, so I can really relate to um, everything that, that has been talked about today. But uh, my question is that we, we keep talking about you know these terrorists and, um, uh, and everything that's been happening in South Asia, in the US. I feel like we haven't talked about uh, how these terrorists have managed to actually get where they have gotten. I'm talking about funding. Where is this money coming from? <laughs> this, I don't, I mean, to be honest, I don't think it's coming from Pakistan. I don't think uh, it's coming from India. But there has to be some network that is flowing the money into these terrorist organizations. and. That's the only way that they can actually do what they're doing right now. Well, I understand it's uh, our good friends, the Saudis, but why don't you ask well, the... <laughs> you, you're basically right, you know. And I, I, was, I also alluded to that in my talk. You know. Networks do not function in isolation. This is the underworld. This is the world of smuggling, of trafficking, money laundering all kind of activities that goes around in that part where the terrorists have had. And not, not, not now, it's been going on for decades and decades. By the way, any, pick up any report and figure out what's the drug situation in Afghanistan, what, what runs there, you would know that it runs into millions and billions. That is the hub of over 70, 80% of the world trade. Now, it's coming down, but it's not quite gone away do you from think there. It's, do you think it's drug money? Of course. It is all the drug money that's being channeled in, or do you think it's actually uh, some other organizations, maybe even in uh, Saudi, that are, actually, that are uh, supporting these groups? Well, so if the Saudi state is now supporting, you know, the, the way the terrorist financing has been monitored for the last six, seven years, they'll be caught sooner or later. It's not that easy anymore. We know the Hawala and the Hundi system that has been functioning there. There are, there are, there could be other finances. After all, Osama bin Laden was basically a financer. After all, that money had, was still there. There is some money that comes from somewhere. Somebody has got tons of money to do that because Taliban is paid much more than an Afghan soldier is paid today. We know that that how that happens. And uh, and Mumbai incident. You think this could have just happened without that? There are. I, I mentioned the word cross trough pipes. You know. These networks at some level have got connections with each other. Drug, there's mafias, they all have connections somewhere. It doesn't quite function there. And this is a lot of study that really be required as to figure out what these cross networks are. I've agreed with your question that it is much more than that. But right now, the most important thing is, look at the drug that goes across in, in, in Afghanistan. These warlords are actually thriving on these drugs. And all over Europe and all over Asia, this is the center that goes across. And uh, unless and until that is going to be taken control of, there is no way I can see stability in Afghanistan is coming because there is so much alternative uh, money that is going uh, that is gone there. How has the U.S. not been able to figure out, figure that out? 
as in, <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, the kind um, of. L l let, me, let me just say that, that um, it, it, would be, it would be tragic to, to see this in sort of simple demonized terms that, oh, the, the, the awful Afghans are trading in drugs again, or, or the, the Pakistanis, or ISI, or any, any of the things we know about this sort of the narco satrapy that, that is, is that part of the world. Um, just as the drug trade in, uh, in Latin America and in North America and every other part of the world uh, functions, uh, that enormous drug trade is done with the collusion of its customers and of its customers' governments and of its customers' cultures and societies. Uh, you, have a, you have a vast, vast black economy here. The Pakistanis don't have a monopoly on black economies. Uh, we, we have one, you must know. And uh, so it's not, it's not just a simple matter of, of, uh, of condemning. Yes, of course, the, the terrorists are funded from all sorts of different sources. And, and there are lots of governments that have a stake in, in the instability. And, and there, are, there are governments that are weak in, in geopolitical terms, but can exercise great influence with money. And, uh, and the Saudis are only, only one of those. The Iranians play that game, the Israelis play that game, the Chinese play that game, uh, and they have for a very, very long time. But, uh, but don't imagine that, that even if we somehow eradicated all the, the, uh, the heroin crops in, in Afghanistan, uh, or if you nuked the country or whatever you did, that you would necessarily uh, solve the problem. This is a lattice work of international corruption. Which is, uh, which is vast, really vast. And, and again, I just want to say our, our complicity is, is enormous. But just to follow on from that question, General, I understand that the uh, Lashkar Taiba's charitable wing, uh, Jamat Dawa, is, is um, run by the founder of Lashkar, who runs a charity, who lives in a compound outside of Lahore that's is it, and he's entirely financed by the Saudis, including all the madrasas that he runs. At one point it was, I, I do not know whether that, that still functions in the same way or not. Uh, but um, this group, which is now no longer known as Lashkar, they, they have renamed it as uh, you know, Jamaat al dawa uh, They do a lot, great deal of philanthropist work out there in, in, in Pakistan, you know. But they, they did a lot connect. of work. After they the do a lot of work, especially in yeah. earthquake and others. You know, right. and anybody who are neutral observers, including Americans who were there in Muzaffarabad, have told me, you know, that the, the the kind of work they actually did was they won the hearts and mind much faster than anybody else could have done. I mean, this is the truth about how, especially in that uh, time in 2005 when the earthquake came, and evidently they do not conduct any activity there. You can really put point a hand and say you you did something terribly wrong. You know. But so it's, it's very it's difficult to really. Right. Now they have. I mean, there's some evidence provided there. The military operation has gone about three, four days back. They have nabbed them. But in the end of the day, again, now uh, somebody pointed about the lawyers movement. Now, how will you prove into the court what wrong they did? You know, end of the day, you know, you have to figure out as to what, what really happened. So that's why, uh, you know, these joint investigation, these, uh, you know, intelligence sharing. Uh, this coalition and this cooperation is so important so that, you know, you pr provide foolproof system so that you na nab it once and for all, you know. I, Saudis I, I, will be terrible to be, to be doing uh, this if they are really involved in this. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I, you know, I, hearts and minds, it j just reminded me that, that uh, you know, the, the social welfare function that many radical Islamic groups perform all over the Middle East and in South Asia is, uh, is a direct result of a vacuum created in part by American foreign policy. We were the ones who enforced with the World Bank and the IMF and international financial institutions the kind of rigor on these economies that forced these governments to reduce their social welfare expenditures systematically over the 1980s and 90s to the point where, as in, it's true in, in, uh, in Egypt, it's true in the Middle East, across the Middle East, and it's, and it's true in South Asia, that the, the vacuum then was filled by these, uh, by these radical Islamist groups that do win hearts and minds and do perform. And this is, this is the Pendergast regime in Kansas City. I mean, they gave, uh, when it got cold in the West Bottoms, uh, you could go and get blankets uh, at City Hall. And guess how you voted uh, the next time around? I mean, this is just the oldest equation in politics. Who gets what, why, when, where? Down in front here, this lady in the second row.
Thank you. Um, I just wanted uh, first, before I ask my question, to comment when you talk about the present situation in Kashmir. It's really extraordinary that Christian Amanpour just did a huge two-hour documentary on genocide from World War II onward and never talked about partition. It just somehow doesn't, doesn't make it into the news, and it's a tragedy that we're all not more aware. My question is just really simple. What can we do? You know, we can't necessarily change our government overnight, and there's differing opinions on op, um, how optimistic uh, that viewpoint would be, but the common thread that's running through here is there's there's a struggle for water, there's a struggle for food, there's concern about energy. People are gravitating towards the people who can offer them education and security and just basic humanitarian needs. So when we leave here tonight, those of us who aren't politicians or economists or work in intelligence community, what can we do? If the world can sort of be mobilized to start thinking about Darfur, then what can we as just ordinary citizens do to create more awareness and, and make a meaningful contribution? If Greg Mortensen can make such a huge impact, one man on a shoestring budget building schools in northern Pakistan, then surely the collective wisdom and a few dollars from the likes of us could, could make an impact. So I'd just love to know what you all think we can do to make a difference. General? Well, I have to narrate a little, if you give me a little time, you know. This is UCLA campus, and I, in, in 2002, in the, in the month of April, I've had an experience, and I had sown myself, I'm never going to talk about Kashmir in a UCLA campus here. Because there was a conference going on here, and I was speaking on nuclear weapons and, and its relation to Kashmir. And there were Kashmiri groups sitting in, in, in a hall like this. And, you know, about 400 of them just riled up, you know, not against me, but against somebody who made a remark about atrocities in Kashmir. This is 2002. They literally attacked that. And Los Angeles Police Department had to come and whisk us away. So I have some memory I was a little thinking about when I was coming here. Uh, you know, so I said, I won't talk about Kashmir. This all took place in the August uh, faculty club, I might add. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that was by Stanley Volport, so he was sitting yeah. just in your place, and he had to say, General Khan, just move away before you're lynched on the stage, you know. So, uh, so that was my well. little experience of Kashmir here. And again, the Counselor General of Pakistan, uh, Mr. Abbas, uh, it was Rana who was sitting here, and she saw all that drama that happened here. So uh, just a little bit. And yeah, I mean, uh, look, in this era of information and globalization, if uh, Christiana Amanpour missed that, I know that she is a, uh, a journalist of a lot of integrity. I cannot blame her for that. There must have been some policy given by CNN to her. It is not possible that she would have missed out, as, as I know of her, clearly, you know. And if there is something that missed out, and I'm not trying to say a political position of that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm much more realist to believe what it was. But BBC correspondent was going on in the valley, right, and speaking to students there. And he asked a very blunt question to some of the students who were saying, why are you protesting? What, who are you guys? They said, no, we are IT guys. You know, we're just coming out of from a, you know, IT. so where are you going to get a job? They said, Bangalore. They're Kashmiri. So, so the logical question was, what the hell are you protesting about, you know? He said, well, that's another thing, but, you know, I want the Indian Army out there. I'm, I'm talking live BBC I heard on NPR. At the time, nobody was worried about these issues. They did go and talk to those people. But he says, I just want them out there, out of that place. Yeah. And then the, the amount of explanation that they gave, you know, that they even went into the hospital and beat them up with gas and a lot of, they, they, there were reporters who did that. But you know, the, 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 this is a policy of the media not to pick up what they don't want to pick up. And the blunt question that was asked to them was, don't you realize India is a great power? Nobody's going to listen to your voice? And they said, well, it may become any great power. As far as I'm concerned, I, when I go home, I don't want my mother to be you know, in fear of being molested. Now, I, I'm not trying to point any finger out there. I'm simply repeating what that guy said and who was an educated guy in Srinagar. Now, these are the kind of things, you know, that it is heard. It is, and I heard it in the United States. I didn't hear it from anywhere else, which means people do go and talk about it. There are honest reporters who go, do go and talk about it. But it is a media policy in this country which has disappointed me greatly, regrettably, that, you know, you pick up a la carte 
rather than you know stand up for a position regardless of the position and nobody is asking you know but where it is wrong is wrong whether it is pakistan army or indian army or bangladesh army or afghan army or wrong must be done wrong if there is atrocities people must raise voice otherwise there will be no sanity left people with use of force must be tamped down military forces are you know by armed forces law this uh, they cannot just use with impunity unfortunately in that valley there is very little question asked about that aspect of kashmir i'll only stop here please don't lynch me i only said what it was <laughs> Roger, uh, could, you, could you address the other part? Of yeah, the let, let me address the American side. You know, the the bad news is that Barack Obama is a politician, and the good news is that he's a politician. And uh, I think this administration, despite uh, its uh, its beginnings here, I think will be more potentially susceptible to uh, to influence, and I think it will be. Uh, more able to learn than any administration in our in our living memory, and uh, so what can you do? Uh, you can uh, you can be much more informed than the American public has ever cared to be on these issues uh, before the disaster rather than after, and uh, and you can uh, you can exert uh, the pressure which is which is yours to exert. Uh, this is a very fragile coalition. This Democratic president sets astride. And uh, he's converted a, a red country into at least a purple one or a semi-purple one. Uh, but nothing is for keeps at this moment. It's a, it's a very tenuous thing. It could turn on a dime, and uh, he's going to have a huge economic challenge. He can't afford. It, it's, it's the one nice thing about our economic collapse. We can no longer afford the margin for foreign policy disaster that we afforded over the last half century. And, uh, and that's, that's the good news. You can, you can exert much more pressure and have much more influence. Uh, and you've got, to, you've got to educate your, your, uh, your congressmen and senators, too, because they're all, they're all thinking in, in old, very old, antiquated terms. Just in the back there, uh, last question. I think we're getting close to the witching hour here. Uh, hey, I just want to thank both of you guys. Uh, that was a really fascinating discussion. Um, I uh, just, <laughs> just, just real quickly, um, this, this question is actually directed to both of you guys. Um, I guess that my main concern is um, from a military standpoint uh, with the Taliban, because going back to right after 9-11, I was actually traveling, I was in India at the time, and uh, I just remember the one thing that really struck out to me was that literally the entire world was behind us at the time. And uh, I have a lot of family that are in the military. And I was just wondering, like, because uh, I do believe in a just war, if we get all of our troops out of Iraq, as Obama promised, we devote it to Afghanistan, um, can the Taliban uh, be defeated militarily? That's my main question. General? No. Going to pull them back in? Yes. No, they cannot be defeated. They, they will not be able to be defeated militarily. There may be tactical victories here and there. There may be some situation where their operation can be crippled, but the method of their fighting is such that they will continue to fight. Have you heard a phrase of that part of the world? They say, You got the watches, I got the time. That's how they fight. And they're the same people who have done that repeatedly. So, you know, one should learn from history and rather than, you know, get entrapped into the process. End of the day, you know, th this will be unending if you continue. I, I said in my presentation, excessive kinetic force create even more and more terrorism. It's a bad strategy. You have to use force very, very clearly. And in that part, the use of force for military forces is very difficult. Perfect intelligence, precision, kind of a operation that does not do any collateral damage. And fast mobility, rapid mobility to beat them before they beat you on the mountains. They run like goats. Soldiers, I, trust me, they know their terrain like the back of their hand. Unless and until you have these three things, no military operation is going to succeed. In the end, you're going to kill more women and children, and then you're going to create thousands of Taliban in the process. This is what's been going on for seven years. That's what I was trying to allude, that brutalization is not a strategy. It actually, especially in a warfare where you have a nebulous kind of an enemy. Sooner or later, 
you know, the cause, I, like I mentioned, uh, I hope I can repeat that, but I don't want to be condescending here. I can repeat that. America is not concerned about the cause of war. America is concerned about method of fighting. Unless and until you get concerned, you can take the sting out of them. It's very easy to them. You know, when pain becomes greater than the, uh, any other uh, gain that you're getting, the lesson will be learned. They're human beings after all. You, they, they will understand what it is. And when they have an, another alternative incentive, right now they have none. They have no incentive whatsoever. And that incentive has to come in some shape that if they give up what they give up, what do they get in the end? That's simple logic of this. And there's a lot of studies have been uh, carried out in history on this issue. What do they get in the end? That's what they are looking for. And that's, that's the way to go about it. Oh, I, I, I don't really want to end this, despite the, the burden of my remarks on such a pessimistic note. But you know, uh, Afghanistan is, they're, they're just, it's sort, it's, there, there's no exit. Uh, it, it's an atrocity if you stay and pursue, uh, first of all, we're not capable with all due respect to the, to the general, our generals are not capable of conducting that kind of sophisticated war. Uh, they, don't, they don't know the, the politics of the place and, and precision is not, is not really our forte. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and if you go, it's an atrocity in terms of what you leave behind. It's an atrocity if you stay. Uh, it, it seems to me that, that you have to pick the lesser of evils and the lesser of evils may be the Marshall Plan uh, along with uh, the, the best security you can give, along with the repression of the very worst of the atavistic forces, but you're going to have to negotiate with some of them, and you're going to end up with a government that you're not, you're not going to like, and it's not going to be a, a model democracy or a model human rights or women's rights uh, regime in any sense of the term. Um, it's, you're going to have to pay the piper. And, uh, and meanwhile, the worst thing I can say is that uh, people like you and your family uh, are, are going to be making uh, uh, unspeakable sacrifices as a result, if that's the course that we do choose, because a lot of American kids are going to die. Well, just a, just a quick question before we close here, because I expect it to come up in the Q&A about nuclear command and control, since you've experienced that firsthand. Um, the Dawn newspaper reported, the, the, the major English daily newspaper in Pakistan reported recently that during the worst of the crisis in Mumbai, uh, the president of uh, Pakistan got a phone call from what, who he thought was the Indian foreign minister saying that uh, apparently chewing him out and threatening and as a result he put the uh, air force on the highest alert and presumably also the nuclear uh, forces on highest alert. That does not give you uh, c comfort uh, about command and control. Is that true? Well, I, I don't know about the hoax call. There's been so many spin to that and denial and, and all that. But let me tell you from a pure security standpoint, this is not the first time Air Force and other security forces in Pakistan have gone on alert. Uh, if there is any iota of doubt that there is even a rumor out there, it is the job of the security forces to go on alert. This happened in 98. This happened in 1990. This happened in many times during my service. The command system must be ready to, just in case. It doesn't mean that you are ready to show up guns. It only means that you do protective caps. You do start protecting your assets. Pakistan lives under the fear of survivability of its strategic assets. They have had a long history. The command and control is predicated on a history of preemptive and preventive strikes that dates back from the day Israel struck in Osirak and India thought of destroying Kauta in 1984. From that point onwards, the Pakistani alert system is very rapid. Crisis in South Asia takes hours. You know, it's a, it's a very melodramatic country. You know, here you are about to really have a great peace, you know, and, and you're, you're talking about swiping cars and people going across the border. And there you are on the border thinking of a nuclear war within the next day. This is what exactly, no, no other country is so, so interesting, you know. I mean, like, like that. This is what it is, you know. What do you do with command and control system? They're in peacetime, lying quiet. They're, they're not mated. The, the Air Force did not go up in nuclear weapons. I can tell you. I can be so 100% sure. The, the F-16s were not flying with nuclear weapons, I tell you that. But, you know, there are sensitive, sensitive sides in Pakistan. They are fearing a preventive strike. They're fearing a sort of a hot pursuits. The military has to be on the alert. And there's no way that it, it cannot be done. And the very fact 
that Indian Navy slipped, and if this, true, this is true how it happened in the harbor of Mumbai, it is a security lapse, and I don't mean to say that Indian Navy, I'm, I'm a soldier, you know, things can go. They were looking, they were not really looking into what, that this could really happen to them. But obviously, everything was on the alert. These days, you can look into Google search, you could have seen how the Indian Navy is now actually, actually, you can look at today even, go into the Google and find out how the Indian Navy is actually moving out from the Mumbai uh, road. As we speak, as I speak today, the Armada is moving out, the ships are, because they just don't know. Now, there they are watching the real-time things. The Air Force doesn't just go out like that because Zardari got a hoax call. They have got much more, mm -hmm. better means to figure out what's going on. They are monitoring every Indian uh, base. They are monitoring every Indian uh, movement from peacetime locations. Have you heard of a doctrine called a cold start doctrine? This is a military doctrine of India that will start a cold start war within a matter of hours or days in the event of such like thing like Mumbai attack. Now, if you imagine if the Indian and Pakistani forces are living on an edge and an event like Mumbai, Mumbai would have happened, there would have been a war even before the politician would have picked up or even given a hoax call. The Indian military would have been striking across. And in my presentation, if, I, if you record, I still mentioned that Mr. Holbrook should go and have a very careful look as to what is the nature of military doctrines in South Asia emerging. And therefore, this is, this is a region on the edge, unfortunately. And they've had a bad history of crisis. And from peace to crisis, it takes few hours. And that's the reason why it happens. It does not happen because somebody makes a, a call, you know. Well, from cold starts to a warm end, let's all give our uh, guests a warm round of applause. Thank you so much for coming, both of you.